today marks International Day for Disaster Reduction. As a woman who is a great leader in the UN, in development and politics, and now in academia too, there really doesn't seem to be a glass ceiling that Valerie hasn't broken or had a good go at bashing in. Thank you for joining us. I'd also like to introduce our host for the evening, Emma Barnett, bringing, I think, the most amazing piece to the Telegraph, which is the women's section. So, no more ado, um, I'll leave it to you. I think all of us here would greatly benefit from knowing what you think Britain's response should be to Assad and what's going on in Syria. Uh, actually, if you think about what has happened to the economy of Syria, if you think about the number of people who have fled over four million uh, registered refugees, so the number who have fled is even bigger than that, we as an international community have actually watched the collapse of a state. And we have watched a level of brutality. We have been paralyzed by political differences. And to watch what, what has happened, and then you know, suddenly now, we have a European Union because of the refugee crisis really waking up to this and trying to push for political uh, uh, solutions uh, is something that we should be very, very ashamed of. At the beginning, the international community left it. Uh, we had a group of people who were trying to argue uh, for greater engagement, greater democracy in their country. They were, they were crushed. We watched them being crushed. Um, and we left it. I also think that some very serious mistakes were made. The fact that a number of countries said right at the beginning, yes, we can work for a political solution, but Assad cannot be part of that discussion, actually meant that you didn't have a negotiating starting point. What should Britain's response be? Well, I think um, Britain has to work hard within the Security Council to try to make sure that there is a path to a political solution in Syria. I have a huge concern that much of this is now being seen through a security lens. So it's all focused on you know, tackling uh, ISIS and the fact that you know, ISIS has taken so much uh, territory. It's not going to help to resolve the political differences uh, on the ground. We have to do our part in terms of receiving uh, refugees from uh, Syria and I think we have to demonstrate political leadership in relation to that. So we need to take more refugees? I certainly feel that very, very strongly. I think that, the, that EU countries all have a collective responsibility. The reason that we have so many refugees in uh, the last uh, few months is because people are now desperate and they've given up. People went to Lebanon and waited because they were hoping that the crisis would be resolved. They went to Jordan and waited because they wanted to go back home. Now, uh, it's so far down the line and they see no possibility of a resolution. They are now going further afield because they want to uh, establish a life for themselves. They want to be able to work, they want their children to be able to be uh, educated. We are one of the richest countries in, in the world. We have a degree of responsibility to help people who have a lot, lot less than we do. Do you not think David Cameron has done that? The government has said that over the next five years, we will take um, uh, a number of refugees directly from camps uh, in neighboring countries to come to the United Kingdom. In terms of the numbers of refugees that are coming into the European Union, it's a tiny, percentage compared to the size of the UK and the size of our economy. I also think, and uh, the Prime Minister has talked about this, that it is important that we try to support the countries that are neighbouring Syria that have, for the last four years, borne the brunt of the refugee flows. But the thing that is going to stop those flow uh, of refugees is for the fighting to stop. Uh, and we would do exactly the same if there were a war going on in the United Kingdom, the people who could leave would leave because they would want to protect their children. Would you support military action by Britain in Syria? Military action has to be part of uh, a strategy which says the military action is for a particular purpose and links to a very clear humanitarian agenda 
um, linked to a very clear development uh, agenda and a, a very clear political process which is about uh, ending the conflict. But I don't see that military action on its own is going to achieve very much. It doesn't seem like we can do this in the way that you're talking but, about. But, but this, is, this is the challenge, in my view, of having a humanitarian crisis that has just got worse and worse and worse over time and where we have not been able, in my view, to, as it were, embarrass countries into recognising that they need to have a more integrated strategy and that what they cannot do is just bring their narrow political interests into uh, uh, that uh, discussion. And at various points we were able to do that on the humanitarian side as I and others made the point to the Security Council about the deterioration in uh, the humanitarian situation, the impact it was having on uh, ordinary people, the high levels of you know, sexual violence, uh, communities being put under siege by the government of Syria or by opposition uh, groups and uh, starving people being used as a weapon of war. As a result of really bringing that to the attention of the Security Council, we were able to get uh, three Security Council resolutions on humanitarian issues, which enabled us to make uh, a degree of progress. But that, what I'm saying is it's not enough. It's not enough just to pour more money into uh, humanitarian response. You've got to stop uh, the violence. You've got to help people uh, to uh, rebuild their communities and rebuild their lives. You've got to hold the perpetrators uh, of uh, violence accountable for their actions. You, you have to have a long-term plan to rebuild a country where 80% uh, of the value of the currency has been lost uh, over four How, years. I, I understand these steps, but do you actually then, just zooming right out, do you have faith that the current infrastructure, the UN, the Security Council, that can do this? We would not uh, be in this situation if the countries that sign up to the UN Charter were held accountable for their actions. We should be putting pressure on our governments to actually uh, deliver the things that they sign up to at the United Nations. Has the UN left you inspired or has it left you cynical? I've seen so much that's horrific, but I've also seen so much that is amazing in the way that people with very little, relate to each other and support each other and help each other. Children who haven't been in school for weeks and months, sharing a pencil and a piece of paper uh, in, uh, in a tent, um, you know, mothers supporting uh, other people's children. And you cannot be cynical about that. You yourself have been a first of, of many times and I just wondered if you could give us an insight into you're actually the first uh, black woman to run a university and this is obviously four weeks into the job I mean how do you feel the pressure of being essentially a trailblazer? I think I'm very good at what I do and um, I'm very confident uh, about all of that but at the same time it's just me you know you don't wake up in the morning and think you know I'm a trailblazer <laughs> um, I think I have to hand over to you now, if that's possible, and we have some roving mics. Would anybody like to ask a question? Is the bigger question really, is the UN system broken? Well, the UN undoubtedly needs reform. Um, uh, uh, and I think, I think part of the trouble is that everybody recognises it needs reform, but you know, there is no member state, actually, that that necessarily wants that reform to affect the things that they particularly care about. Is it possible that the UN is ever going to be effective when it is formed as a trade union of nation states who, as you say, are all very jealous about the things they really care about, which touch on themselves? I watch this happen. You know, the whole of, of the United Nations and all the treaties and everything else are predicated on this idea of national sovereignty is the trump card. If what you have are, you know, governments that are essentially terrorising 
their own people, then there needs to be something that trumps that, in my view. You know, what is the point of signing up to the UN Charter and the values in the Charter and the human rights, you know, if actually these things are meaningless? Every single time I went to Syria, the Syrians would have a page open at the relevant bit of the UN Charter or the mandate of my own organization to tell me, you know, you can't do this and you can't do that because it says here that you cannot uh, do it. If we really don't hold each other accountable in this way, then uh, it is not going to change. But just to, to end on a more positive note, I did see this issue of national sovereignty being used in a more positive way. So in many of the countries where you have natural disasters, you had countries and regions saying, actually, we need to do more in terms of um, disaster risk reduction, uh, preparing our uh, people, putting the resources in place at the regional and at the national and the local level so that the United Nations and the international community actually is the third or fourth line of response rather than the first line of response. So I saw the positive, but I also saw the very, very serious negative, and the serious negative is almost always in a conflict situation where a government expects to be supported whatever they're doing and however they're behaving. And we have to get out of that mindset. Baroness Amos, thank you very much indeed for your time and thank you to you. Mm -hmm.